here to celebrate the life of a well-known friend to me and to the different communities that I represent in here today. I'm about to not just bring in a, a man, but bring in a friend into the church as we commence the celebration of his life. Let's all stand. the Lord. So we want to encourage his family that he makes a way when our backs up against the wall and we think it's all over but he makes a way. For he makes a way when our backs are against the wall and we think that it is all over he makes a way and we are standing here only because he made a way Cause walls to fall with your power. And you have prayed for us. There is nothing that's impossible. We are standing here only because you made a way. against the wall and we think that it is all over Lord you you make a way you are standing here only because you make a way so we are standing only because you make a way hallelujah we give God praise we give him thanks we give him honor and we give him glory let us all pray father we come before you together today we know that as we are in the midst of life, we also experience the departures of our loved ones. And today we are gathered here because you have chosen to recall Carlos home into eternity. And while it is, we believe to be absent from this body is to be present with God. Over on this side, we feel the pain, the friendship, the love, the relationship that we have, both his family and many who are gathered here today. Father, we are praying for your strength, that you're going to strengthen his family with might by the spirit in the inner man, that you are going to strengthen mighty God, all of us, that we will be able through the power of your spirit, that we will go through this exercise as we prepare for the final internment, as we celebrate the life, as we reflect upon the man. We are asking you, O oh God, to minister unto us, especially to his family, because we know moments like these are very riveting moments, but we pray for your strength. We ask you, mighty God, that you are going to minister to us in a very special way, as you alone can, 
For we ask these mercies in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. So we call before you take your seat. We want to do some singing and rejoicing before God. So we call Sir Patrick's musical uh, ministry as they come to lead us in worship and praise to God. Hallelujah. Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, we are a small part of the St. Patrick's Music Ministry, and we are absolutely honored to be here this morning as we celebrate the life of our brother Carlos Clark. What we would like to do is to lead you in a, in a series of songs that we consider praise and worship. So we're going to give God thanks, we're going to give him praise, and we're going to celebrate the life of Carlos in song. And so, we want you to join with us, all right? The songs that we are going to lead and we are only lead are songs that you all know, all right? So we're going to just lead and we ask that you sing along. Carlos, what a happy soul, what a happy spirit, what a delightful person he was. And so this morning, while we grieve him and while we acknowledge his loss, we also want to celebrate him in a very happy way, all right? So we ask you to join us and let's lift our voices lustily as we celebrate a great man, a true friend, a blessed soul. I am 
Good on my Nivalian, talk to Jesus. Good on my Nivalian, talk to Jesus. Good on my Nivalian, talk to Jesus. Jesus answers prayers. Good on my Nivalian, talk to Jesus. Good on my Nivalian, talk to Jesus. Good on my Nivalian, so why are we talking? We have Jesus on the main line. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Tell him what you want.
done with you. I want us all to leave our burdens by the riverside. Come on, church, everybody now. Leave your burdens down by. lift our souls. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> you may be seated. We are thankful for that passionate time of worship. Uh, and we give God praise and thanks. Let me say a very pleasant good morning again to all that are here gathered in the house and welcome. I want to before I hand over to Elder Ray Sandy, I want to especially honor today the members of the Tobago House of Assembly present. And first of all, I want to extend our condolences to Elder Wayne Clark, Assemblyman. And I know that you have been very close to the Pentecostal Light and Life in your years of work. Now you are in the Assembly. We want to acknowledge you and extend our condolences to you for the loss of your brother Carlos. And um, so we are saying to you, be strong and be encouraged. We want to acknowledge Assemblyman Sonny Craig. We are happy to have you here. We are also acknowledging Reverend Terence Beans. Uh, Assemblyman, we are very delighted that you are here today. We are happy to have uh, Assemblyman Trevor James. We are delighted to welcome you in the house. And we are very happy to have uh, Brother Pollard, Assemblyman, in the house today. And Assembly of Man Joel Sampson, and also Assemblywoman Sirtika William Orr. We welcome you. And all the other people who are here from Taxi Corp and the different areas where Carlos have impacted the lives of individuals. I see that there are 
a long escort that will be in place by the bikers. You notice that his helmet and um, is also there as a ardent member of that community. To all of you who are here today celebrating the life of Carlos Clark, we say welcome and that the blessings of the Lord be upon you. At this time, I invite Elder Ray Sandy, who will take proceedings from here. Much, thank you very much, Pastor. At this time, we'll call upon Miss Judy Frank to do a scripture reading. Miss Frank. This is a teaching about love for enemies, and it's from Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 to 48. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there? That, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Frank. We'll go into our tributes next, and I'll call upon Mr. Cloyd Williams from the Tobago Taxi. Maxi Taxi Association to bring his greetings. As Mr. Williams um, takes his step forward, I just want to indicate that Carlos was not a friend of mine, but someone who I knew very well. And I, would, I, must, I want to boast here that I was instrumental in getting Carlos a piece of land at Hope Farm when he had to move from outside of the Division of um, Infrastructure at that time. So I'll take that, um, that, that kudos from him. Um, for, for in, encourage him to go up there and for his, the benefit that he got for going up on that parcel of land. So I'll now turn over to Mr. Cloyd Williams. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Let me just say all protocol observe. You know, he says that there is one thing that is certain in life, and that is that. Um, so, from the very outset, let me just say, on behalf of the Tobago National Maxi Taxi Owners and Drivers Association, we want to extend our heartfelt sympathy for the life of our dear friend, past member, um, Carlos, a very good guy, very resourceful gentleman. Um, I said a few things ago, some time ago, in a funeral in Bethel, and I'm going to repeat the same thing now. Um, where I live, there's a guy, he's always on the street. He's homeless, he's clothless, he's foodless. And um, when the news came to me and said that Carlos is no longer with us, I asked myself the question, I said, Lord, why couldn't it be this guy? But then I said, I, I'm, a, I'm not God. I'm judging, and um, God knows the best for all of us. And the Bible says in everything that we need, we must give God praise and thanks. Maybe not in death of Carlos, but in the circumstances, uh, we need to give God praise and thanks. Um, a few months ago, just about maybe two, three months ago, I passed and I checked Carlos. I just knocked the window and I said, Carlos, 
um, you know you're supposed to buy a new Maxi for Avi. And, um, and he said to me, Clyde, I'm doing something, but when I finish, I will buy the Maxi for Avi. I said, Carlos, it's time enough. The Maxi is shutting down always on the highway. So you need to upgrade. But you know, coming into the church this morning, it might sound a little humorous. I saw this beautiful casket. And what came to my mind, I said, listen, I hope all the money did not spend on the casket, but some remain so that Avi can get a new casket. Not new casket, a new maxi. You know? So that is still in the pipeline. So, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, Carlos was a good guy, and we truly want to express our heartfelt sympathy to Avi and all the siblings. But I just want a little support now, so I'm going to call on my Maxi colleague to just surround me so that we can just do this display and we depart from here. So I'm seeing just a few of them here. So I call on you, that's Peter, Phil, Bruce, um, Nigel, and others. Just come quickly so that we can truly do this quick demonstration as we move from here. Right, and um, maybe you're driving your taxi man, you can come on down. All right. Um. All right, so. What are we going to see? All right, so we just want to do just a little demonstration that will bring some hope and comfort to your soul. All right, three, four. May your soul rest in peace. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. I will now call on the representative of the nurses of the dialysis unit, Scarborough Regional Hospital, to pay tribute. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shawnee Roberts. I am one of the nurses at the dialysis unit. And um, also, Carlos's goddaughter, right? Um, this is Nurse Mackenzie, his goddaughter as well, and Tracy Joseph Ramsey, our head at the unit. Carlos is also my neighbor, so I know Carlos since I was a little girl. He's one of my father's very good friends. And when Carla started at the dialysis unit, I was not there, I was on leave. And when I returned, I saw him. So I always addressed him as uncle. So I said, uncle, what are you doing here? And he smiled. So it was bittersweet, I was able to be there to take care of my father, uncle, and patient, and to be there until he took his last breath. So I'll now pass you on to his next goddaughter. Um, good. All right, good day, everyone. I am Melissa McKenzie. Um, I would have known Carlos a very long time ago. He was a very good friend of my father, Matthew McKenzie, and uh, we got even closer during his time at the dialysis unit. Yeah, that good. Every day as I entered the unit, it was always Miss Mark, and then he always had some story to give about something that happened between him and my father a very long time ago. 
always a joke or some story, and I would say, Carlos, them stories is true, you're making them up. <laughs> because sometimes it don't sound real at all. But he never answered, he would always laugh. Um, one time he said, him and my father went to do a job by somebody, and when they finished going to collect the money, the guy said, <laughs> he had to go and ask his wife permission first. <laughs> So the guy's name was something Mac as well. He said, next thing the guy come back and said, Mr. Mac, Miss Mac said that money too much, you know, we can't pay that at all. <laughs> and every day I came to work, Carlos would say, Mr. Mac, Miss Mac said that money too much, we can't pay that at all. And last week as I entered the door and Carlos wasn't there, and I didn't hear that joke. It just wasn't the same. Um, up to the last year or the year before, we were doing some work at home. Carla said, Melissa, anything you need, just call me. One day he said, what material you had to get? And I told him, and by the evening I reached home, everything was in the yard. I said, but Carla said, and tell me the price as yet. He said, don't worry, I will talk to the workers to charge you reasonable. Another time I called him, I said, I need somebody to do X, Y, Z. He said, all right, I will send somebody. When the guy came, he gave me the price, and then he said, but I can't do it right now. But well, the price was kind of hot. <laughs> so I said, Carlos, I wouldn't be able to use him enough because he said he can't do it and the money too hot. Next day, the guy called me back. He said, as you get the material, let me know. And the new price is now X, Y, Z. He said, somebody pleading on your behalf. I have to come and um, do the work and I can't charge you that price again. So I just want to say on behalf of myself, my mommy, um, my sisters, Arlene, Lisa, Ava, my brothers, Arthur, um, I see Auntie Pat and Uncle Tio here, and the rest of the Mackenzie family, um, con condolences to, um, to Miss Clark and Abby. Hi, everyone. Although Carlos was born in 1956, it wasn't until 2018 he became known to most of the members of staff at the dialysis unit. Who could forget that it was Wednesday, May 9th, the guy with the gold eyes walked through our doors, down the hallway, and ended both our lives and our domain. For five years and five months, we developed a professional yet friendly and jovial relationship. He always had some old time saying. When he heard anybody was getting married, he would say, listen up, spice is a thing that does smell sweet. Hmm. It's sweet and nice enough, but when you taste it, it does burn your mouth. All you go ahead. <laughs> he took us down memory lane many times talking about stunts he pulled through his life. One stunt, when a certain godchild's father called him to retrieve some money, and he said, I had to walk with me when I was going. He spoke about the, his days of riding his bike, going from place to place, people he met, and the fact that he felt carefree on some days that he roamed from one place to another, going even from island to island. Let me recall a few ways in which he made us laugh at the unit. If you had more size than him, and it was your time to step on the scale, and he was behind you, he would say, hey, is only one of you could go on that scale at a time, eh? <laughs> if you had a little body pain or a minor injury and you came to that unit with a limp, he would say to you, you see you, you need a good straightener. And if you dare to ask why or for what, his response was, what happened? You didn't realize your chassis been over. <laughs> Sometimes, it was our turn to heckle him. Carlos, that belly, 
too big. <laughs> it done big already, and it getting bigger. His response was quick and witty. If a famine comes now, I am a reserve. No food store in this belly here. I remembered him having episodes of decreased blood pressure. After working our nurse's magic on him, he came around, and one of his infamous comments was, eh, eh, what all these ladies doing by me? Something good had to be sharing here. <laughs> one day, in the quietness of the unit, no talking, no TV, patients napping. Carlos called me, hey, Trace, come girl. Everybody alerted because we know it was something. Hear what Carlos tell me. Trace, if you know you can't make it to heaven, don't fight up too much. Don't force it. Eh? Carlos go work out something for you. <laughs> OK, darling? During other meaningful and serious conversations, like not the one we had on Wednesday, 11th of October, he would say things like, Trace Gill, if I could pay to keep, my, to keep on living, I would. I too share the same sentiment. This is my wish, not only for myself or for him, but for so many other, other persons. Carlos, your shift is a bit quieter now. At the start, we no longer hear, are waiting for clearance, nor do we hear the rustling of paper bags or foil being unwrapped while his head was covered under his blanket. <laughs> nor on the end of treatment do we hear, I could take off now, clearance has been given. <laughs> there is now a quieter space as we mourn the loss of Carlos. One thing we are sure about is that God placed you in our lives for a moment, and you made a big stamp. And then he called you to get on your Harley one more time and ride into the sunset with him being your official guide this rounds. Your dialysis family mourns with you, Carlos. We join with your blood family today. We are not going to forget you at all. But in the meantime, get your rest. Rest in peace, peace Carlos. Nurses of the dialysis unit, I want to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Farley Chavez Augustine, the Honorable Farley Chavez Augustine, Chief Secretary of Tobago, who have joined us. Assemblyman Sonny Craig, the air representative for Buku, he will come to give his tribute. Assemblyman. Is it working? Oh, yeah. Testing, testing. Good morning, everyone. It's always an odd feeling to say good morning or good evening at a funeral. You wonder what's so good about a day like this. And when I heard the sentiments expressed by the speakers before me and the jovial atmosphere they brought to the room, this can't all be bad, because Carlos was a good one. And um, I am honored to be here, all protocols observed. I'm honored to be here as the area representative for Buku Monpezant to say a few words. I am blessed to have been very conscious and very alert as a high school student back in 1977, 78, to see Carlos as one of the motorcyclists of that time. In those years, the gangs traversed the streets with 
massive motorcycles with the, the mufflers cut off. So when they're coming from a distance, everything had to go silent as, the, as these gangs passed by. I, got, I knew him also as a mechanic or a guy who is always around gadgets, olaya and trailers, backhoes and so on. I also knew him uh, at Deuce, um, Deuce Tire Shop. He would be there liming from time to time and he and Deuce always in some argument. And I used to be there as a customer, is dropping, or McQueen, as you say. So then they would argue politics, they would argue sports, economics, and I would listen to them, and sometimes Deuce would say, Carlos, you know you're real wicked. <laughs> and they had that kind of friendship that they could be that brutally honest with each other. I just observed the gentleman over the years, and. I'm blessed to be in a, in a team now with assemblymen that include his brother. And when I heard the nurses speak about his returns, when you told him something and he was always quick to give you an appropriate return, well, my friends, his brother is here to continue that tradition. Because I tell you, he's really good at that. And, and so, all in all, Carlos brought so much goodness to this space called Tobago. He seemed, um, not he seen, but he definitely came from a strong family. He has a strong wife. He has strong children. And he seemed to be, and I, I'm, I'll stop saying seemed to be, he was a strong godfather and a strong friend. And I know that today is a sad day, but um, about 20 years ago, I read an article in The Guardian, and I'll never forget it, because... It was that impactful. A young man asked his father on his deathbed, he said, Daddy, do you think I did a good, Daddy, do you think you did a good job? And his daddy's reply was, if after I've closed my eyes in death, you cannot continue and to become a success in life, then I failed you. But if after my death, you keep crying and grieving and you cannot get yourself together, then I fail you. And I never forgot that story. And I'm, I'm looking at the composition of the, the house today and I'm seeing people who have been impacted by him. And I know that the impact he has made on all of our lives, we will, and more directly his children and his wife and his immediate family, relatives continue to move forward in life and to make that impact. When I saw his daughter driving the maxi, uh, it, it said something in, in a culture like Tobago, not very many women gravitate to this kind of work. Historically, traditionally, it's a man's job. But it says something about the family from which he came, that they are not limited by culture or whatever else you might want to put in the conversation. If something has to be done, it will be done. And I noticed that in Carlos' Carlos's life also, from the time he had that massive garage next to works across the river, till the time he went up into Hope, where he set up his operation at that time, he was always on the move. I never saw him as a fellow who is just, will just sit back and allow life to bring it to him. He would take it to you. He would bring the fight to you. And from there, I knew he was destined for success. So as a child, I looked at him, admired him, and one thing I learned from him is that I'm not going to hold on to any job so tight that it's not going to, that it's going to debar me from really pursuing what I really want to do in life. So I'm very happy to know that I'm associated with this family, even if it's from a distance. I'm happy to, have, to know his brother now. I knew his wife down at NP, and she was a firm, strict um, person on the job. No messing around, smile at the right time, and give you a change and see about the people's business. And that was the kind of woman she was. So I'm not discouraged. I'm not fearful. I know that today is a sad day. I know tonight they would spend their time without him. But I pray and I'll admonish that when we go into tomorrow, they must feel the confidence that everyone seated here is backing them. We have your back as a family. We support you, we love you, and all in all, things will work out to the best. 
So accept my condolences as area representative, and I'm seeing that I'm the only assemblyman on the program. So on behalf of the Tobago House of Assembly, I must say accept our condolences and press forward. We are with you all the way. Thank you very much. Are you here? Okay. At this time, I'll call on the representative of the Bikers of Trinidad, Mr. Steve Youngs Aslan. Testing. Good day, everyone. My name is Steve Alson, better known as Yank. Um, I just want to give a little tribute concerning my brother, which I met many years ago through Mission Riders. Um, Carlos was a guy that I met and was always humble, was always cool. He never actually um, gave any kind of, how I'll put it, problems, he always a humble person, and I just want to say on behalf of Trinidad and Tobago and Hood Riders, that call us, and God bless you, you rest in peace, and may your family, and condolence to Avi and her family. God bless everyone, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. I'll now call on Mr. Dunstan Leslie of the Tobago Mission Riders Motorcycle Club to do his tribute. He has already blessed us with his um, singing ability, so. Thank you, Master of Ceremonies. Blessings again, Church. And as I respectfully observe all protocols, I firstly want to thank you, Pastor Frank, and the Clark family for giving me or providing me the opportunity to pay tribute to Carlos on behalf of the Tobago Mission Riders Motorcycle Club, of which he was a founding member. So I will just quickly say this. You are here, we all are here, because we have had the experience of Carlos in one way or another. We were blessed by his presence, and we were impacted by his life. And in so saying, I would just want to take a couple of basically words and turn them into adjectives to describe this gentleman for whom I've known for such a very long time. So if you allow me, I would just simply say this. Carlos Tubber Clark, certainly he was a loving, devoted, and doted husband. Barbara, you meant the world to him. A proud and committed father. I remember he once intimated to me that um, one of his proudest moments in his life was when he had the opportunity to have him, his daughter join him on many of the social rides that we went on as motorcyclists, brothers, sisters, family alike. <clears throat> A very respectful gentleman, soft-spoken, kind-hearted, humorous, self-giving, selfless. Generous. Carlos always would put himself last so that you can have first. And one of the most interesting things about the brother is that, the, I mean, everyone knew him for his witty humor. But I think we, the members of the Tobago Mission Riders, I can certainly attest, knew him as a great mentor. Carlos told stories through humor. But if there was ever a great psychologist 
who did not have a degree was this gentleman because often you would walk away, if not the same day, sometime thereafter, thinking, reminiscing, introspecting on some of the things that he said and some of the things that he thought you. That was the gentleman he was. And so, as I talk about his selflessness, i just like to leave with you a few words because as I pay tribute to Carlos, knowing the kind of person he was, or is, he would prefer if given the opportunity to pay tribute to us. So I thought about, you know, if he had a few last words to say to us, what would they be? And so I have a small narrative that I came up with. I'm sorry, family, in the words of Carlos. I'm sorry, family, that I can't be with you today. Can't join this celebration today. But don't worry, even if I'm going away. I don't want you to shed a tear or wear a frown. Because believe me, I won't be gone for very long. I've had a wonderful life. I love my kids. I love my family and unconditionally my wife. I love all my drinking buddies and my lifelong friends. And so let's raise the toast, guys, to a party that should never end. You know I love the highways, small and blue. How I love the curving mountain roads. And I love the back roads. You are among my dearest friends, brothers and sisters of the road. We've traveled many miles together, islands together, and shared many heavy and light loads. If I could be here, we laugh and share the memories of our past. And this gathering would be just one more tale, another story, and certainly not our last. But today, I can't be with you except in your hearts and memory stays. So you'll have to laugh. Lift a glass to me. And let your engines roar. Please smile and do not shed a tear. Wipe away that silly frown. Because believe me, friends and family, I won't be gone for very long. And as I depart, I just want to pay homage to the brother as we lift a ride and ride to live. Right in peace, Carlos. Thank you very much, Mr. Leslie. At this time, we'll address ourselves to giving as we pick up an offering our Deacons will be in place. I, one of the things that I'm not very good at is singing. I'm confined in my house to be singing only in the bathroom. So I'll hand over this chair to Reverend Dr. Glenroy Frank, who will take over from, the, from me. Uh -huh. Jesus, he's a way maker, Jesus. He's a way maker, Jesus. He's a way maker. One day he made a way, oh glory. When I was lost in sin, Jesus came and took me in. One day he made a way for me. Oh, Jesus, he's a way maker, Jesus. He's a way maker, Jesus. One day he made a way, oh glory, when I was lost in sin. Jesus came and took me in. 
One day he made a way for me. Oh, so I'm wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in Jesus. I'm wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in Jesus. I'm wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in Jesus. Jesus made a way for me. joy. I still have joy. After all we've been through, we still have joy. We still have joy. I still have joy. After all I've been through, I still have Good morning, everyone. At this time, I acknowledge Reverend Dr. Glenroy Frank, leaders and members of the People's Pentecostal Church, the beloved family of Carlos Cecil Clark, Barbara Savriqua Clark, his wife, Avian Brian, Darren, his children, Jalen and Jalil, his grandchildren. Chief Secretary, Honorable Farley Augustine, and other members, other assemblymen of the Tobago House of Assembly. Nicole and John Mark, his son and daughter-in-law, the Tobago Mission Riders Motorcycle Club, the Tobago Maxi Taxi Association, his comrades, all other relatives and friends of Carlos. Today I've been given an onerous task to deliver the eulogy for Carlos Clark. I couldn't figure out just how to do this, and I spent many uneasy moments trying to map this piece of writing. Why? I was sure that I knew what a eulogy is and what to do. But I actually Googled the meaning of the word. I wanted to double check. All the definitions gave me the same answer. Create a speech or a writing in praise of a person who recently died. So what was my problem? Writing a speech praising Carlos Cecil Tubber Clark is actually easy. 
But here's my challenge. I knew I had to put it in a manner that allowed me to take on his cloak and do it in the way that he would do it, but in fine style. In other words, I could say just whatever I wanted to say, but with few words. I could bring to life this giant of a man one last time, but I can't waste too much time talking too much because that was not Carlos. So I'm not sure if his wife and his children gave me a blessing or something else when they asked me to deliver this eulogy. But you know what? One thing I know is that I'm honored and I'm grateful. So God is most amazing. He's unusual, insightful, as we know him. And sometimes, God is the most unorthodox being, and he gives us the most magnificent gifts wrapped in simple packages. He gave us one. On November 20th, 1956, when he sent Carlos Cecil Clark on his earthly sojourn. I say this boldly only after engaging with several persons who knew him long, and well, because I didn't want my word city to be clouded by just my own personal experiences and my interactions with him. And eventually I started wondering about his names. Why so many C's? Carlos, Cecil, Clark. Was it his parents' favorite letter in the alphabet? Or was there a deeper spiritual force driving his naming. So I went back to my favorite place, Google, and I Googled words to describe persons, C words. Well, of course, I looked for the, the good ones. Because when I started going through the other ones, I realized that we didn't really have much there. I came up with a long list, and I was kind of confused because they were kind of connected in some kind of different ways. And then I went to research T words, because I'm trying to figure out now about the tubber, where that come from. But I was no better off. And so I still had a problem about doing the eulogy with brevity. But it was clear to me that Carlos's eulogy is a CT1, a short discourse about his earthly purpose to bring a life to C and T words. So I'm inviting you to join me. I'm about to jump on my bike and invite you to ride with me for a spell. I was tempted to cruise on Carlos's shiny, awesome, powerful purple machine. And I wanted to invite you to hop on the back with me on the pillion seat. But then I remembered that few men could ride that machine. That was the power of the man. So we settled in for my bike. So I'm inviting. Strap on your helmets and let's roll. And let's take a short journey into C and T. And as we move out, we're rolling down Clark Highway. We're going to observe all the sea signs we could find. The streets, the buildings. Sometimes we're sailing, but sometimes, hold on tight, we're flying. Clarky, calm. Clever, clear-headed, credible. This was a man whose judgment you could trust. He was a problem solver. He was a wise old soul. And he was the consummate optimist. Contemplative, conversational, 
candid, cheerful, all wrapped up. He was a deep thinker who provoked others to deep reflections on the issues and the vagaries of life. He was extremely engaging, but he was honest, and he was awesomely comfortable in his skin. So we roll in, and we've seen caring, committed, compassionate, contented. Family was everything to Cecil. His wife, Barbara, his children, his grandchildren, his extended family. His son, Brian, speaks about his love for his family and describes his dad as the ultimate supporter and the provider. He cherished his wife. He loved and protected his daughter. His grandchildren were his bundles of joy, and sharing his love for cashews and plums and pears with them were priceless moments. His offspring learned many life's lessons by just observing their father. He was a man of action. Few words, but those words extremely impactful. His tenets for living, treat people the way you want to be treated. Live well. Integrity must be your watchword. Be fair in your dealings. Your word is your bond and your measure as a human being. Money has power to do good, but life is not about its accumulation at the expense of the well-being of others. He was a peacemaker. He hated conflict, but unafraid to stand on principle. As a senior brother of the Tobago Mission Riders family, this was the man we knew the brother we love, Carlos, was a classic. Constructive, courageous, competent, confident, commanding respect. His entrepreneurial spirit was inspirational, unafraid to use his talents and his skills to enter and navigate the world of business. Carlos was extremely supportive of the growth and development of others, and especially young folk. He encouraged and supported, and he did it quietly with much humility and grace. Young people were special to him, and they actually gravitated to him. He was like magnet. They want to hear the stories. They want to hear about life. He had a lot to share. And that he did. Collaborative, charitable, contributive. His generosity knew no limits. He was a driving force behind the annual Tobago Mission Riders toy ride, taking toys and food and chair around Tobago every Christmas to families deserving. But he was also meaningfully supportive, and provided relief to deserving causes throughout the year. Sometimes money, at other times heavy equipment, construction materials to improve lives. The children and the elderly were special to Clarky. Carefree, coolest, and of course there was a fun fill side. And the funny side of my brother, he loved the fast wheels, the two-wheelers, the four-wheelers. But motorcycling was his passion, a passion he shared with Brian and Avi. Seeing him gift his daughter his special love, talent, and courage as he rode next to her was truly a rare and beautiful sight. I can tell you many stories about Clarkie and Mission Riders and the adventures, the fun, 
the jokes. And he would weave a story like nobody else. And he would have you holding your stomach and begging him to stop. But he never stressed, he never failed to stress safety and the importance of ensuring that each and every one was in order. We, the Mission Riders family, will always remember our many journeys with our brother. Around Tobago, in Trinidad, with Yanks, Hood Riders, Freedom Riders, and our other biking comrades. In Grenada, St. Vincent. He's gone. He went before us, before we could sail the seas again, thanks to COVID. But we know his spirit lives with us. And of course, he was cute, impish smile, green eyes, bubbling laughter, the belly moving, the shiny eyes. Those were his trademarks. So having gone down Clarky Highway, I want us to zip across and take a quick trip on Tubba Boulevard. Because we have to head back to town, back to church, back to business. Tenacious, talented, thoughtful, thrifty, tolerant. Song familiar, right? Kind of like C. Tough, triumphant, tender hearted, top of the line, timeless. No need for more words. The letter T is as good as the letter C. And I will use one more C word to describe my amazing brother, Celestial. I saw God whenever I saw Carlos. He represent God's spirit on this earth. And I started by noting how unorthodox and how insightful God is. One of Jesus' most powerful instructions to us here on earth was for us to love thy neighbor as thyself. Carlos Cecil Tubberclark did just that until just about 4, 11 p.m. on October 12th, 2023. At that time, he returned to God's warmest embrace. I extend sincere condolences to Barbara, Avi, Brian, Darren, and the rest of the Clark family. You are special. Because you were given the opportunity to walk alongside Carlos on this earthly plane. May his spirit and memories always keep you warm and comforted, even as you navigate your new normal. We know he has joined the other angelic bikers, roaring along the heavenly highways and byways. And I can picture him on his new purple machine equipped with celestial wings. Oftentimes, looking down, and all the time, looking over us. So, Clarky, we don't say goodbye. We say, see you later. But we feel honored to know that when the roll call of the next Heaven Riders meeting comes up and the other biking angels ask for your credentials, Karen and Rayon will be there smilingly greeting you and saluting you and proudly declaring he was a Tobago mission rider. And that makes us feel warm. I heard Percy and them say, they think they saw you saluting us along the highway this morning when we were coming to church. Carlos, we love you. We thank you. We salute you. We celebrate you. May you ride with the angels and soar with the saints. 
Ride free, mission rider. Live to ride. Right to live. May God bless you always. Thank you, everyone, for your love and your appreciation for Carlos Cecil Tubba-Clark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Lois. At this time, I'll now call on Pastor Sonia Whitlock. We'll deliver to us a special sound. Grace and peace be unto you from our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. I am Reverend Sonia Whitlock, pastor of the Sanctuary of Praise, Worship Tabernacle, and by extension, I'm the manager of Belgros Funeral Home. And so, today we do not mourn like those who do not have hope, because God has given us that blessed assurance when he says, let not your heart be troubled. So... I declare the peace of God, the strength of God, and the comfort of God over the family during this great time of loss. You may not know how, you may not know when, but we know most definitely that the God that we serve, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he changeth not, but he will do it again. He'll do it again. You may be down and feel like God has somehow forgotten that you are faced with circumstances you can't get through. And right now it seems like there's no way out and you're going under. But God's frozen time and time again. He'll take care of you. And he will do it again. Oh, yes. He'll do it again. If you just take one look at me. same God now as back then you may not know how you may not know when but he'll do it again see God knows he knows the things that you're going through and he knows how you're hurting you see he knows just how your heart has been broken into uh, but he's the god of the stars and the sun and the seas this god is your father if he can calm the storms he'll find a way to fix this Hasn't, hasn't the Lord always come true? 
and he will not fail you. I tried him and I know that he's God, and he's fighting for you. I know, I know, I know that he's God, and he's watching over you. Oh, just love. I want to start off by saying good morning. Well, now is afternoon, 12.08. I tried to write a speech, but I didn't get very far. So I just have a couple of words. And I would try to take this in the same style as Daddy would speak to us, short and sweet. But I have to start off by saying thank you to everyone for being here and taking care of my mom and my sis, because I really believe in a village approach. And that's also the way that he lived. He would help anyone. Even though he didn't have it himself, he would find a way to help. He believed in that. He also taught us to treat people the way you want to be treated. And that is something that I've always taken with me. He also firmly believed that your word is very important. If you say you're going to do something, no matter the cost, you have to finish it. You start it, you finish it. He often used his humor to teach us life lessons. And a lot of the speakers before said a couple of words that were very touching to me. There are things that my dad said to me as a little boy that I didn't understand until I was in my 20s and 30s. And some things even now I'm still processing. He didn't teach us lessons by just words. He taught us by his actions. And that, to me, is even more powerful than any words that can be spoken. I remember many, many years ago, there was a take a parent to school day. And at the time, mainly my mom would go to events like that. And she was a little busy, so daddy had to come. And believe it or not, I was a little terrified, because mommy mainly represented the family. But my dad showed up calm, cool, collective, and ended up being the center of the show. And he was the comedian. And it was at that day I realized just how blessed I was and how great a man he was. I had never seen my dad in that light, but he is the ultimate comedian. So with that, 
I would like to close and again thank you all for coming out and showing your support to our entire family. It means a lot to me and to my family. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. And we feel the same about your dad. At this time, I'll now introduce Reverend Dr. Glenroy Frank who will bring today's message. Bless the Lord. Again, I want to give honor to whom honor is due. We have our chief secretary here, and we are very, very delighted to have you in our presence today. We welcome you at the People's Pentecostal Church. I want to say to you that uh, Barbara and the family, they are members of this congregation, and on the behalf of the People's Pentecostal Church, we want to again extend our condolence to you and Avion and Byron and the entire family, his daughter-in-law and grandson. And uh, I promised them, because Carlos was also a friend of mine, and um, we talk a lot because our love for construction, you know, I think it's, it's probably more than bike riding. The bike riders are trying to, to say how strong they are, but his love for construction, I think that is the joyous side part of him. But I think that his love for this area and mechanical things, which extend to excavator and trucks and, and so on, and for many who are from that community here, uh, as pastor, I acknowledge and we, in that group, also offer our condolences. His wife and daughter agree that I must sing a song for him. And um, I will do that. Men, let Christ to Calvary and he didn't say one word but it was the price of lost sinners it was all Savior heard. You know they pierce him in his side and his blood came streaming down and that's how he our salvation and I find no fault in him men let Christ to Calvary and he didn't he didn't say one word, but it was the price of lost sinners. It was all you know the Savior heard, and there pierced him.
to speak to you for a little bit from the word of God. Now, every time someone die, I cannot remember how many funeral service that I've officiated in. But I started my journey as a pastor since 1980. And several people. But every time someone dies, the question of that sense of not knowing. I think Job, with all his calamity, in Job 14:14, 14, 14, and you, if you know the story of Job well, he went through a process by which he lost not only his wealth, but the day came when he lost his ten children. And it spurned a question in the mind of Job. If a man dies, can he live again? Would he live again? And then Job alludes to the fact that anytime you cut a tree down and it, a portion of it remains in the ground, it springs up again. And the whole concept of a resurrection, of coming back, there have always been contention in the minds of people who listen and try to understand God and what really transpires when a man or a woman dies. I believe that the reverse take place to that which happened recorded in the book of Genesis, where the Bible says that after God considered with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, he said, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. And the Bible said that after God would have put all the intricate parts, I remember visiting this museum in Atlanta, Georgia, and they have people who would have donated their, their dead bodies to, to demonstrate. So there's one particular body that identify all the veins and there's a, a light that replicates. And there may be about four or five bodies that's showing different aspects of the human frame. But the Bible tells us that after God would have put in all those intricate parts in, in humanity, that he breathed the breath of life into man and a man became a living soul. And essentially, there is a part of man, body, soul, and spirit. So there are, there's one part of the human body that is earthly that will go back to the earth and become dust. And at some point in time, the Bible promised that if we die in Christo, in Christ, that we will be assured of a resurrection. So what happens that day when, when Carlos die, according to what, what I see uh, speaking to me from the scripture, is that that breath that God breathed into man and he become a living soul, it separates itself and go back to its maker. So all we have here is the body. It no longer moves. It, it will no longer preserve. The uh, undertakers may put some chemical in to hold the body, but eventually it will go back to dust. That, that essential part of a man leaves. And that is why it is so important that the sorrow and all that is appropriate, the sympathies and the condolences are all. But one of the things, I don't know, because every time I talk to Carlos, I say, boy, make sure your anchor hold and grip the solid rock. What I was saying, make sure that you make it right with your maker. 
And he would only give me that smile. <laughs> give me that smile. Many times when he would have come to church with Barbara, he would just sit in the back a little bit and, um, and so on. I, I'm, I don't know what decision he made between him and God. But the issue today is not about Carlos. The issue is about you and I. Are we in a position that if God would call us now, that we can say that I have made that decision because there, there is no negotiation that makes. It's appointed unto a man once to die. And after he is dead, then, then, then that's it. On that side, there's no other um, a negotiation he could make after the fact. Now, the closest that we have to know about what happens about a person after they die, it, 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 it is found in, in the book of Luke, speaking about Lazarus and Dives. Because the Bible tells us that Lazarus was a, uh, was a man that his nurse was, was a dog that licked his sore. But then Dives was a very wealthy man himself and his brothers. And, and the Bible said that they feared sumptuously. As a matter of fact that, that Lazarus only benefited from uh, when, when the man will throw out from, from his stable. The, the, the leftovers, and he ate from his dustbin. But I'm not saying that to say that the people who walk with God have to be stricken in poverty, and, and, and just because when you look at the other side, as the man called Abraham and all of these great patriarchs of the Bible, you realize that God took care of all the people who stood for him. Nevertheless, it is important for us to, to get the story because I believe that Jesus was telling us that if we don't make proper decision, now if you recognize what is happening, we have to go to Trinidad. Sometimes we call with Biwi when they don't have enough flights. We have to go to the port and we're frustrated because even, even the other day when, when, when we had the breakdown with the boat, it was a real problem here. We go to buy bread, and you couldn't. It just tell us that we need to have a little more bakeries in Tobago, etc. But that's another story. But the, the point that I'm, that I'm making with us today is the fact that we make preparation for everything in our life. We, we took the time and we make preparation for the day that we will come and have this funeral with Carlos. We put everything in place. Uh, when those abroad could come in, when we have it set in the place, when members and family, everyone settle. We, we plan for this very well. We have all the pictures, all the flowers, all the bookies set in place. But you know one thing that people are not focused upon? Is to prepare for eternal life. To prepare for when we die. And we, we, if, if a person don't use their life insurance, when, when they prepare for death and have a life insurance, really and truly the, the insurance is very skillful because they are able to leave something for the family. But the, the insurer or the insuree, they don't benefit anything except probably if they get the money in time is to get a, a, a good casket or something, you know, a, a hearty wake or whatever the situation is. And then if there are families that are rowdy and quarreling, they don't want too much to spend on the wake because they are concerned about how the thing will part up after. We prepare for a lot of things. But we don't prepare for death. Every one of us will die one day. Are you prepared? Now there was a fellow in, in, in the book of Luke chapter 17, the Bible said that 
he, he came to Jesus and I said, and, and when he was gone forth, out of the way, I'm reading from verse 17, there came running, a man running and kneeling unto him, leading to Jesus, and asked him, Master, good Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Because the, the understanding of eternal life is something, is a discussion that, that we must be conscious of. The Bible also tells us, recorded in the book of John chapter 3, where uh, Nicodemus, he was one of the Pharisees, he was in the leadership of the nation at that time, and he came to Jesus by night. There are many who argue that he was ashamed to come by day or whatever the situation is. But I, I noticed that apart from the miracles and the things that Jesus did, when he had conversation, most of them was around dinner time in the night. So then Nicodemus came and he said to him about eternal life. And, 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 and Jesus was saying, listen, for you to inherit eternal life, you must be born again. And he said, Master, what are you saying? Can I go back into my mother's womb a second time and be born? Because he was baffled by it. Because many of us are taller than our mothers. Many of us are bigger than our mothers. So then he was saying, how can we go back into our mother's womb and be born a second time? And, and, and Jesus said, no. The, born, the, the birth that I'm talking about is the birth where you are transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Where you turn away from that evil path into that path that brings glory and honor to God. Where the Bible says in, in, in the book of, uh, of, of uh, Corinthians that therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are past and behold all things are become new. So this man, he, he was very wealthy because the story is told that he said, what must I do to, to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus was but very even a little bit sarcastic with the guy because he was, he was telling him, why, why you call me good? The reason why that there was a heavy rejection as good and great, miracle-working, powerful man as Jesus was, there were a group of people called the scribes and the Pharisees who follow him every day and try to discredit everything that he did. So when this man came and called him good master, Jesus was sanitizing the conversation by getting the mama guy out of the place. Why are you calling me good? It's only God that is good. So he was testing where the guy was coming from. But then he said to the guy, he said, listen, and I'm, I'm reading it hot, hot off the press. He asked what it was. Jesus said unto him, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Or, you know, in these days we are troubled by false news. Somebody will just go on Facebook and identity um, theft and all those things are happening now where people can frame your life and, and try to embarrass you with, with, with information and on social media and so on. So, so Jesus was saying, bear no false witness. When you speak, speak the truth. D defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. And the guy was anxious because he was impeccable where these things were concerned. And verse 20, he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I observe from a child. And if you check the list, he didn't speak falsely against anyone. He was faithful in his relationship between himself and his wife. He, he did not um, uh, kill anybody. He did not steal from anyone coming down, 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 down the road. And he passed that. What, the, what did the commandment say? Where that was concerned, he was blameless. From his youth, he observed these principles. But Jesus got into the conversation again. And he said, uh, Jesus, beholding him, 
and loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. And, and this is the point that I want to make. And I want you to recognize that in all of us, even though that to serve God or to, to live for God, it may be easy to, to surrender all those major sins that were identified here. But there was one thing there was one thing that lacked. Even though he, did, he obeyed his mother, even though that he did all these things, that one thing, that one habit, that one behavior that is so difficult to surrender. Because for anyone to inherit eternal life, it means then that they have to make it right with God. And this is what this thing about. Let us not just cry for Carlos. Let us not just reminisce on the great man he was. And just think about the great friend that both of us enjoy. The friendship. At the same time, we need to think about when our time, like Carlos, would come. Where would we be? Can we be guaranteed that after we pass this life, God can say, well done, thou good and faithful. And this should be the, the main thing upon our mind. There's nothing that we in this life can do to Carlos. If, if we leave this casket right here, it's there you're going to stay. If we never take the body to the book, we say, that we're going to say there is nothing more, no activity that he can do in this life. And I'm not saying that because I want to be callous. What I'm saying is that this meeting here today is for us who are alive. That we can note that our relationship with God is permanent and we must do everything possible to make sure that we are right in the sight of God, that when our times come, that we can meet our maker and he can be pleased with us. So, so, so Jesus, remember the conversation started, the man was asking about eternal life. Now, now hear this. So after Jesus told him that the one thing that thou lackest, he said, I want you to do three other things. After you deal with the one thing that you lack, I want you to do three things. What was happening here? Because while it is that we don't uh, behave wrongly to our parents, but, but, but I would also say that what I observe, that there are many of us who need to be better to our parents. There are too many people I'm seeing from where I sit as pastor, that especially when their parents get in old, especially when their parents retire and get some money, they borrow it out. They borrow out their, their money. Uh, uh, listen, uh, this is one lady came and she said, oh God, pastor, oh God. My money done. My money done, you know. I said, but how your money finish? Oh God, me get a boy there. The brother borrowed all. He always has some kind of trouble. He always has, has something coming. Always. Listen, stop sitting down and work out how you're spending your daddy pension or your mommy pension. Because many of them are dying in disgrace and shame because of how we are Tobago people we, we are accustomed to extended family. And we need to do better. You need to, to bring for your parents rather to take from them. Especially when they are no longer in their work of years. If you go to change their pension for them, don't use it out. So, what I'm saying is that 
I'm just putting this in there. We need to care and remember who used to change your diaper, who used to give you supper. Don't forget your mother and your father. You know that old Calypso? Remember when you couldn't even walk? Remember when you couldn't even talk? Remember who? It is very, very important for us to recognize that this guy was saying that I did not digress. But I'm saying because I'm seeing too much of it that we need to care for our elderly a little more. After a while, when they cannot bathe themselves, when they cannot move themselves, we just dump them there in a home and, we, we, you know, too much problem, problem, problem. And leave them there. If you have a situation like that, start caring differently for your parents. Be patient with them. Don't ball up on them. Don't rough them up. Treat them with honor. And so on. But this guy said, Jesus has passed the test. So Jesus asked him to do three other things. The first thing he told him to do, he said, I want you now to go your way and sell whatsoever you have. And after you, you would have sold it, I want you now to give to the poor. So what was happening with this guy? While he was good, taking care of his parents, did not commit adultery, didn't do this, didn't do that, do that, he cared nothing about people. Cared nothing about the poor. He cared nothing about those who were going through a struggle. And it's not that Jesus wanted to, to leave, to, that this guy get broke, you know, to tell him, sell all you have. Because Jesus said, for those who follow me, they will have houses and land and, and all that and eternal life. Another passage of scripture said that. So what Jesus was trying to do was to deal with this guy. He was dirty rich, he was wealthy, but he, he did not reach out and touch somebody's hands to make the world a better place if you can. Well, you heard the nurses when they were here. But they were saying that she had some work to do. And the fellow decided that he will give she a hot price. She needed a pot cloth to hold the price the guy was giving. So he decided that she will call up Carlos. And I know him to be that kind of fellow. He would call him and say, man, how you could do this to this lady? You have to take down your price. The, the lady going through a struggle, man. My God. You, you don't know. So when the guy called back quickly, you know? But the part I, I wondered about, you know, he was telling them about heaven that he could make a negotiation. <laughs> I don't know about that part. But at the same time, that's the kind of man he was. But you see, the thing about it is that there's one area in our lives that prevent us from really embracing God. And God, Jesus, was trying to have this man remedy that he will become a prime candidate for eternal life. So he said unto him, listen, I want you to sell what you have. I want you to give the poor. And the third thing I want you to do is to take up your cross. And follow me. But what happened? The Bible tells us here the man wasn't willing to do any of those. Why, why wasn't he willing to do that? The Bible tells us. He wasn't willing to do it simply because the scripture tells us, verse 22 of Mark chapter 10. He was sad at the saying of the three things God asked him to do. 
is to don't allow the wealth that you have to become your controller and your God. Sell it, Jesus was saying to him. Secondly, he said, put, put wealth in its appropriate place and share with the poor something. And then thirdly, he said, take up your cross and I want you to follow me. You see, coming back to what I say on, at the start, the reason why it is so important for a transformation, a conversion to take place in the life of a man or life of a woman, because that which left Carlos and went back to its maker, you hear what I just said? That, that left Carlos and went back to his maker. The, the, the reason why the, the frame body that God did from earth, making bones and so on and so on, and, and you realize that all the things we eat come from the, the earth. It sustains the body. Sometimes you look on medicine and, and you would see aluminum in there because we are earth. But when that time comes, that, that's, I'm, I'm trying to clarify the reason why God wants that when the, his, the spirit that he would have given pure and true into Adam and Eve, that when that spirit left the, the human body or leaves and, and go back to its maker, God is looking for it to come back in truth. God is looking for it to come back in purity. God is looking for it to come back sinless. Why? Because he sent his son to die upon the cross that we may have life, that we may be pure, we will be cleansed, we will be washed by the shedding of his blood, that we will be prepared to meet him in eternity. So then, that soul or that breath of God where man become a living soul at death, there is a separation. And that is the part of us that goes through and go into the other side. But the problem is, this guy was trying to negotiate. And the last thing out of the three, Jesus said, you have to follow me. If you really want to inherit eternal life, you're going to follow me. But verse 22 tells us that the guy said he was sorrowful and he was grieved. Why? Because he had great possessions. Do you know that Carlos can't manage that heavy bike again? Avion will have a day with it. That heavy bike, he can't ride it again. All our possessions, all we have, we, we leave them behind. But it's one thing that we can leave this earth with. Is having a new life in Jesus Christ. That the sacrifice that God made, which is reflected in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is the flagship that every one of us upon the face of this earth need to make sure. Whether we have brand name Matux or Catelli or whatever it is, or Swiss, or Mabel, or whatnot. Or that I'm saying that to mean whether we say we are Pentecostal, Adventist, Catholic, Anglican, Moravian, Norwegian, whatever we are. All of us, all of us can not hide behind a brand name. Because when God decided to rescue us and to give us the opportunity that we can live a life pleasing before him, what he did, he sent his only begotten son. Only. And that is why Jesus said, I am the way 
I am the truth. I am the life. That no man can come unto the Father but by me. So today, in us celebrating the life of Carlos, I'm saying to us, it's an opportunity that we can make it right with God. It doesn't matter which organization we belong to. Unless we give our life to Jesus Christ and make sure that we are cleansed from our sins, there is no guarantee that we will be. Because when that guy who fared sumptuously and he, the Bible said that Lazarus died and then the rich man died and Lazarus ended up in a place because he made his relationship right with God. But the other man did not make his relationship right with God and he opened his eyes in hell. But the thing about it is that he called out and he said, listen, um, send Lazarus. And that is how we know that there is no negotiation after death. That he may dip his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm tormented in this place. And then Father Abraham said that in your lifetime, you made your decisions. And in, Zach, uh, and, and in Lazarus' lifetime, he made his decisions. And now, one in paradise and the other one in hell. The thing about it is that the decisions we make here in this life will determine what happened to us in eternity. And if there's one thing that we cannot hide, we cannot judge from, is the fact that God sent his son into this world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I rest my case today. I just want to ask anyone in this service, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can raise your hands where you are and I can pray for you right where you are seated in your seat. Before we move on, anyone who did not know Christ, you hear it clearer. You have a better understanding of what will take place and you don't know him. If you don't know him, I know sometimes in these situations, people don't want to identify themselves. You know, it's good to identify yourself. You know, about serving God. Good to identify yourself. Serving God. Sometimes we are ashamed when we are in the house. You, you, you know where I live. I live at Russo Trace. I, I'm neighbor to the, to the present um, cultural complex. And, and I know for sure that, that no one was ashamed because from 2 o'clock on Friday night for that juve until 11, Cars was even parked in my yard at Spring Garden. And I'm not saying this to criticize anybody. I'm just saying that sometimes when it comes to God, your hand not here. But then when it's there, no, no, we ain't going home. We are leaving. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Let us pray. Hallelujah. We want to take special time to pray for the members of the family. Father, we give you praise. Father, we give you honor. We give you glory today. We pray in a very special way for the bereaved family. We know that you are the comforter. You are the mighty God. You are the everlasting Father. And you are the Prince of Peace. And so we commit into your hands the members of Carlos's family. We are asking you, mighty God, that you're going to strengthen them with might by the spirit in the inner man. Giving them, oh God, that, that strength as we go into the final phase, to the final internment for doing the final farewell where we will not see him again. 
We are asking that you're going to minister. And Father, all those challenges that the family would, would face after this, I ask in the name of Jesus that you will minister through the power of your spirit in the way that you alone can, resolving every issue. I, I pray in a very special way for Carlos Jr., and also by extension his grandson. I ask that in the name of Jesus that you're going to minister to them in a special way. We pray for Avion in a very special way. Father, you know of the knitted relationship between a father and daughter. I pray that you're going to strengthen her with might by the spirit in the inner man. We pray for Barbara, his wife, that you're going to strengthen her and that you're going to minister to them as a family. I pray for his daughter-in-law in a very special way that you're going to minister in the name of Jesus. I pray for Assemblyman Clark that you are going to also minister to them in a way that you alone can. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. And amen. So, what I want to have done at this time is ask uh, their undertakers to come. Give us a few minutes again as we give the opportunity for those who might have come in late to do a viewing. And after that, we go to the Buku Public Cemetery for the final internment. Hallelujah. There, there, there's a song there on the bring me the program there's a song there if you want. hallelujah so let's all stand at this time and uh, we ask that this be done for the glory of God we give God the praise and we give him the glory thank you Jesus Jesus Jesus. So as we view, we sing majesty. Worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise.
majesty down from his throne unto his own his anthems ring oh so exalt Christ Jesus our King, oh Majesty, worship His Majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Oh, Jesus who One moment, please. Could you have one moment, please? There, there's one more activity that the bikers want to, to do by filing a very special man over in the aisle while he, the body leaves. They are asking that you, you should not all leave if you can just go back to your seat where you are that you can witness this little biker ceremony. So I'm just kindly asking you, don't depart yet. The bikers have one more thing to do as they, in a, a, a way of honor, take the body of Carlos out of the church today. So this is it at this moment. I can't talk to you now. I can't talk to you now. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. We, we want to have the bikers start to get yourself in place that we can do this last ceremony before we leave the church. So we ask the bikers to come in and take your position because we are almost done with this part. Bless the Lord. King of all kings. So we're waiting for the bikers to come. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Oh, the King. Majesty, oh, worship His Majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Oh, Jesus who died, now glorified. Undertakers to be ready as the bikers come in. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Thank you. How do I say goodbye to what we have? The good for 
We will want to get this done. Because you make this request, where are you? We need to have you here. Bless the Lord. Thank you. I don't And I'll take about to pay final tributes as we at this time depart from the church. We are ready. While we are doing this, I want to, are uh, all the bikers in place? I want to remind you that there is a repast at the house when all is said and done. So we want to do this. We are now departing to the Boku Public Cemetery and also announcing a repast at the home afterward. Bless the Lord, so we are now ready to go. When sorrow seems to surround you, when suffering hangs heavy on your head, know that tomorrow brings wholeness and healing. God knows your need. The, the one last thing I want to say, um, bikers, make it quickly. We we must leave. Time is of the essence. But what I want to say to you as you assemble yourself, as the casket file pass you, the action is you raise the helmet in the air. So we are now ready. You can't hold anymore. When fear wants to make itself at home in your heart, Know that forgiveness brings wholeness and healing. God knows your needs. Just believe what is said. He, he gives beauty for ashes, strength for fear, gladness for mourning, peace for despair. He gives beauty. was lost but God is found. I once was, so I was bound up in sin. I'm free as Been I made righteous in his sight. A display of his splendor all can see. I once was lost but God has found me. So I was bound up in sin. free. I've been made a righteous in his sight. A display of his splendor all can see.
extended more strength as the neighbor increases. So we want to, to do what we call the final internment of Brother Carlos. So today we give God praise and thanks for his goodness. And uh, ready? Behold, I show you a great mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must have put on, incor put on incorruption, and this mortal would have put on immortality. Then shall it be brought to pass that which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is the sin, and the, sin, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, which have given us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as we know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. It is here we commit the body of Brother Carlos Glad to its final resting place. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we commit his body to that place. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 